Okay. So, um, I, I want to ask that question again about open telemetry. There, we, there was only a few people who had put their hand up as people who were using it. How many people have heard of it? Okay. I'm disappointed in all of you. Um, <laughs> um, so, do you all feel like you understand it? Is this going to be um, filling in the blanks, do we think? Because Open telemetry used to be this brand new thing, this, um, this really interesting new thing that came out of the CNCF and people were like, oh yeah, this is this cool library, it does some stuff. Um, but now we're getting to a, a point where it's the de facto standard. It's not new anymore. So people not using it is becoming, I'm not going to say a complete smell in organizations, but there's at least a question now of why aren't you using open telemetry? What's the reason why you've chose vendor agents? Why, what's the reason why you've chose to use something that isn't portable? And there are there's valid reasons, absolutely valid reasons. But we're at a phase with open telemetry where, if you remember way back, nobody gets fired for um, buying IBM. We're at that phase with open telemetry now. Nobody gets fired for suggesting that they should move to open telemetry. That isn't something that happens anymore. Maybe two years ago, three years ago, people would have laughed you out of the room. But now we're not. So I'm trying to kind of do a bit of a tour about this kind of stuff um, and educate people as to why it is awesome, but more specifically what it actually is. Because there's a lot of ideas that people have about what open telemetry is that are wrong. So my name is Martin Thwaites. Um, I am first and foremost an observability enthusiast, uh, activist, some might say, evangelist, whatever you want to call um, somebody who goes and tells people they should be doing it. Um, I've been doing this for about eight or nine years now, talking about telemetry, um, talking about the ideas of how do we understand our production systems. At its real core, that's what we're trying to do when we talk about telemetry, when we talk about observability. It's about how do we understand what's happening in our production systems. I also work for a company called Honeycomb, who do a back-end for open telemetry that allows you to do various different things with your telemetry system. I'm not here to talk about Honeycomb. Um, we're going to do, hopefully, a little bit of a demo. Um, Matt said I only have four hours, so maybe we won't. Um, so. We'll do that, but that will be with Honeycomb. That doesn't mean that you can only do it with Honeycomb. It's just if I did it with one of the other tools, I might be fired, um, and I like my job. So let's take a look back. Let's go back to the OG telemetry. Way, way back, many, many years ago, in caves all around the world, people carved dashboards into the walls and dreaded the time when somebody asked them to add auto-refresh. <laughs> Oh, those were the <laughs> um, I mean, I, I jest. And the, the reason I, I, I talk about this is it's not new. Understanding production systems isn't new. We've been doing this since the dawn of putting things in production. We've been trying to understand what's going on. So go forward to something a little more meaningful. Around the 2000s, it's when metrics ruled the world. And I'll come on to what we mean by metrics a little later. But around that sort of time, we were, we were using metrics to understand everything. And the reason we were doing that is because storage was expensive. Metrics are really cheap to store, especially if you're using things like RRD tool and other things like that. But metrics were, ex uh, metrics were cheap, storage was expensive. My first hard drive was 110 megabytes, and it cost me a lot of money. So we were using tools like this. Any, anybody recognize either of these tools? This isn't a drinking game. Um, cacti. <laughs> I can't remember actually, did I put cacti? Yeah. Um, so there's MRTG and cacti. There was a load of other tools around the same sort of era. So you had Nagios. And I'm skipping over the tools like SNMP and the various different tools that came before it. But ultimately what we're talking about is lines, graphs, with numbers. That's all we're really talking about when we talk about metrics. Now fast forward a little bit further into 2020, 2010, um, and it's starting to get into the origins of what we now consider modern observability. In 2010, Facebook had a problem. Facebook was getting 
rather big. And they were hitting performance issues. And they were struggling to find them. Because at scale in those kind of systems, they don't fail in normal ways. They fail in weird and wonderful ways. And what they created was something called Scuba. Scuba was the idea of how do we build a system that allows us to be able to query any arbitrary context, to be able to graph anything, and then drill in and find out exactly what was going on. So we're not removing context like we did with metrics, they were going really deep to be able to say, well, on a Tuesday, if this person is in France accessing Facebook, but they signed up when they're in the US, it runs slower than normal, why is that? Because if you've built metrics and a dashboard for that, then go you. You have a level of clairvoyance that most people don't. So what they did is they built Scuba. It was this idea of putting arbitrary events, what they called arbitrarily wide events, into an in-memory store and allow people to query it. The reason why that worked is they had this thing called the infinite money cheat button. And they just bought more servers, put more RAM in them, and put more things on there. Most humans can't do that. So that was something that was only in Facebook. Nobody else was doing that kind of analysis. Not even Google was doing that at that time. So let's go a little bit further forward to 2012, 2013, 2014, all the time, that, that sort of era. And this is where we talk about time series databases, TSDBs. And we talk about logs. And that's what we were using back then. It was the dawn of things like Prometheus and Influx, all around that sort of era, which had two different ideas around how we use metrics. Influx was a push model, so that you can take your metrics data and push it into an Influx instance. Prometheus, and back then Prometheus Gateway didn't exist, so it was 100% scrapable. So Prometheus, you'd have an instance, and it would go and gather all of your telemetry data. Two competing ideas, but ultimately it was the same thing. They were taking aggregate information with low cardinality fields and storing those at scale. That was when we did metrics. And then we had this guy, which is my favorite logo ever, because it does exactly what it says on the tin. You stash your logs somewhere so that something else can then query them. So the logo is a log with a mustache. I think we've lost our whimsy in, in DevOps, in IT in general. Everything's gone too corporate. Um, and if you, wanna, if you want the, um, the ante of that, come and get some stickers off me later, because we don't do normal stickers at Honeycomb. <laughs> but we had this idea of just store all the logs, and then we'd use something called Kibana, or Kibana, depending on how posh you are, um, to then view them. And this became a little bit of a game changer for people. Because now all of a sudden we can actually drill into these logs at scale. We were using a system that was built for search um, and using it for analytics data to be able to query these things at scale. And that became a kind of theme. Where open telemetry is now, the elk stack was back then. Where everybody was like, yeah, well, I need to stand up an elk stack, which is Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. And that was just the norm. Then we get into 2017, which is really the year that observability became more synonymous in the industry, but a lot of other things happened. Now at that point, we were talking about something called distributed tracing. And there were two tools out there at the time, open tracing and open census. And like with most open source projects, they had their own ideas. Distributed tracing is the idea of how do we understand how a trace correlates across two disparate systems, process boundaries. So you might have a trace of things, a waterfall of things from one system that was triggered by a waterfall of things from another system. And how do we then pull those two together to make one distributed trace, a trace that exists across a distributed system? We do that using something called propagation. There were two competing standards for propagation, B3, W3C, and around that time, the W3C came up with a standard called trace context. 
And that gradually got adoption. It's still in the recommended state because W3C are, well, they take a while. Like the civil service doing a project. <laughs> It takes a long time to get through. But this was ratification over multiple different big companies from Facebook to Google to Microsoft that were involved in creating this W3C trace context. Because when we have distributed systems, we don't write them all in the same language. Because, well, some, you know, Dave likes JavaScript. And he's going to write things in JavaScript. And John, he likes things in .NET. And Janet writes things in Java. Like, you know, they write things in different languages, so you need some common things that link them together. And that's where these two things try to do that. So Open Tracing had, I think, six languages that they supported with their trace propagation. Open Census had about nine, I think. And they were both competing. And then the inevitable happened, and everybody went, well, we've got two competing standards. So what do we need? We need a standard that's going to unify the two standards under one common standard. And we all know what happens. <laughs> Except that didn't happen. It is the exception to the rule. They both came together and decided that this was bigger than them both and decided to create open telemetry under the CNCF. You may have heard of CNCF. They did a small thing with container ships or something. It's apparently a bit popular. Um, so they came up with this idea of open telemetry. Open telemetry isn't a distributed tracing tool. It is way more than that. So open telemetry became the exception to unify all of these standards together and provide people with a common standard for doing these things. But why does all of this matter? Because we didn't have this back in 20, 2010. We didn't have it back in 2000s. I mean, when I was writing software, when I first started out, the architecture diagram went box line, box line cylinder. It was easy. I didn't need distributed tracing. I didn't have distributed systems. So what has changed? Well, I mean, I've had this slide in my presentations for quite a while. Nobody's disagreed with it ever, <laughs> because we are. We're being asked to ship more often. We're being asked to ship maybe every two weeks, maybe every week, maybe every day, per commit, every hour. I, I was starting out when it was six month deployments. If you miss the deployment, though, we're being asked to ship regularly and more often. And while we're doing that, we're also asking people, can you write some better code as well? Your code needs to be better than it was. It needs to be more efficient than it was. And while you're doing that, can you also spend time less fixing bugs, less time fixing bugs, and more time writing features and generating revenue for the company? And while you're doing all that, can you make sure we don't have downtime? Or when we have downtime, can you make it not last as long? And the problem is that working in production is challenging. Because everything is getting way too complex. In 2020, Monzo released a paper on their website, on their blog, about their microservice architecture, which said, I, I, I like to equate this to the force in Star Wars. They produced that post and then everybody went, whoa. A little ripple through the developer community going, wow, okay, that's terrifying. Because it was 1,200 microservices. It was terrifying. I've spoken to them recently, and apparently it's 3,500 microservices now. It's like, the number should have gone down, dude. <laughs> but we've got way more to know. We're deploying things in an environment where we don't control everything that happens. We can't run things locally. I mean, if your machine can cope with 3,500 microservices, I'd like to know how much RAM you've got in there. Because of that, we've become afraid to break things. Because we don't know. Our system worked, but could that have a ripple effect over different systems? Do I know what my system touches? Do I know what touches my system? And I don't know about you, I'm getting a little bit old. I can't remember what I, um, what I developed yesterday and shipped, never mind two weeks ago. Things are getting a little bit hazy up there. <laughs> But that leads to this idea that we can't find out what's wrong 
We can't understand what is wrong, which means that we can't fix it quickly, which comes under this banner that we like to call psychological safety. People don't feel confident deploying things because it's too risky, so they don't deploy things. They don't deploy things, it gets riskier because they're leaving it too long. They're bunching up changes. It all leads to that. Now essentially, we're, just a show of hands, does everybody know what that's a picture of? A dumpster on fire. <laughs> because I found out recently that there's people in the industry now that don't know what one of those is. <laughs> <laughs> and that made me sad. <laughs> For those that don't know, that's a rack server. There's lots of them in the cloud. <laughs> but essentially, you had this thing in the, the corner of your office with blinky lights, and it gets scary. In the cloud, we have even worse, because we don't see the blinky lights. But we're deploying to these things, we're scaling things up. When I was starting out, writing a ser uh, scaling servers meant going to the shop, buying a rack server, bringing it into the office, putting a CD with Windows in it, and then installing Windows, install hardening it, you know, turning off all the ports. Like, scaling took days, weeks, depending on where your data center was, and whether you needed clearance to get into the data center. The only idea of accidentally scaling my servers was when the computer shop had a sale. <laughs> <laughs> what we really want to go to is this idea that production isn't this scary system that we're deploying to disparately. It really should just be part of your team. Production is just an extra part of your team. It is what you use to service your customers. If production doesn't exist, can you actually deliver value to your customers? Well, no, you can't. That's where OpenTelemetry comes in. Because it's about how do we understand production? How do we ask questions of our production system to understand what's going on? So that it feels like this is just an extension of our team. So what is OpenTelemetry? At its heart, it is a protocol. The first thing that is important about OpenTelemetry is the protocol. It is the data format that we use to emit telemetry from our applications, that our backends, vendors, open source backends, wherever it is, use to receive it. The reason why that is vitally important and the reason why OpenTelemetry has been so widely adopted is because it means that your applications don't need to know about your vendor. When you start writing code, the first six months of any project, at least in the .NET world, was choosing which logging library you were going to use. Because you would have to decide up front because it was prolific over your entire application. Every little bit of stuff that you did, you would add a log line, add a metric, and you'd fight over these libraries. I mean, tabs versus spaces has nothing on logging arguments. But then, the, a lot of these frameworks, they built logging into their core. And then you could build syncs or extensions that pulled that stuff out. And it broke those debates apart. Because now, all of a sudden, you could concentrate on the code that you're writing, log into the raw stuff inside of your um, runtime. In .NET, we use something called iLogger. I mean, Log4j, I think, is the one that they use in Java. But everybody uses a very, very specific one now. But what that did is mean that we can do things later. We can put things off. With OpenTelemetry, we can do the same thing. With logs, with metrics, and with traces. Because your application just knows about OpenTelemetry. It doesn't know that you're using Honeycomb. It doesn't know that you're using Datadog. It doesn't know that you're using New Relic. It doesn't know that you're using Grafana. It doesn't care. It knows that it needs to emit a signal that something happened. That might be a spam, it might be a log, it might be a metric. It just knows that it needs to tell you that something happened. And you design those. And then the protocol is what takes over. Then you can just say, send it to this location with a URL and a header, in the, um, a header with your API key in. That's it. That's all you needed. That is why OpenTelemetry is so powerful. It's not about the SDKs, it's not about the collector, it's not about anything 
other than that protocol, which is what makes it so powerful. There are specs, semantic conventions, there's um, lots of stuff that you can use around it, but ultimately that's what makes it powerful. They do produce as well, or we produce, <coughs> SDKs for 11 different languages. There are languages that aren't officially supported. I found out somebody, come to the, somebody came to me today and said, do you support Julia? <laughs> I'm like, okay. I don't know what Julia is, but let's find out. Um, so they actually d had gone and built an SDK for Julia. So, um, so they build, we build SDKs, and SDKs are what allow us in our code to emit OTLP data, Open Telemetry Protocol Data. Again, you don't need to know where you're going to send it. You don't need to go know how you're going to use it. You just need to know that this is a thing that's important in your code and you emit it. There are currently five things, five signals. Notice how I have not, so far, used the word pillar. Because there are no pillars. There are no pillars in observability. There are no pillars in open telemetry. Pillars is a concept that big logging vendors came up with around 2017 to say that they were observability because observability means a lot more than them. There are five signals that are in progress at the moment. Tracing, where open telemetry comes from, the, uh, the combination of open census and open tracing, that's why that's the first one that was made stable. Metrics is stable across all of the languages as well now. Logging is mostly stable because we use something called a log bridge, which means you can use your native logging libraries in your code, whether that's log4j, serilog, um, you can use whatever logging library you use in Go, I, I don't know. But you can use those and they pump into OpenTelemetry, which means they pump out OTLP data. You don't need to change anything for those. Profiles, the protocol is what's stable right now. Profiles is low-level continuous profiling data of low-level kernel calls and things like that. That one right now is stable at the protocol level, so we know what the protocol is going to look like. And what that does is allow vendors and backends and open source backends to commit to a data format. What we haven't done is built the specs for it in OpenTelemetry, so we don't know what the SDKs look like, we don't know what um, needs to be built there. It is, however, the protocol is stable. RUM, which is the bad RUM, not the good RUM. That one means real user monitoring, not the good one. Um, that one, we're in the design phases of working out what that signal is. All of these are telemetry signals. Open telemetry is this banner over different telemetry signals with those core concepts. Pull out the protocol. Separate the back ends from that protocol. Now, it sounds scary from a vendor perspective because if the protocol is, if the applications don't know, if the machines don't know, they, I've, they don't have to install one of my agents on their server. They can move to any other vendor in a heartbeat. What that does, though, is it means that we're now competing on functionality. We're not competing on lock-in. We're not competing on the fact that you've now got 1,500 servers installed your agent on, so you're never going to move, so we can guarantee that revenue. We're competing on whether we provide you with the best value for that data that you are sending. So let's talk about the signals. First of all, the trace. Notice I've not said distributed trace. A trace is a thing. I hate the definition because the, the, it's so hard to define what thing we're talking about. We're talking about a context of something initiating an action. Something like a HTTP web, web request. Um, somebody dropping something in, in an FTP bucket. We look at all the downstream impacts of that particular thing happening and that becomes a trace. A distributed trace is where we do that over different process boundaries. So you might say microservices, nanoservices, distributed monoliths, where we've got a different process boundary. We take the two traces from those two systems, key them together, that's a distributed trace. But we don't create them. We don't actually create a trace. 
There's no method in your libraries that goes var trace equals new trace. We don't create a trace. A trace just consists of spans with the same trace ID on them. That's all they are. So what is a span? Ultimately, a span is just a structured blob of data. A structured log, if you want. But it has some mandatory properties. It has to have a unique ID. We call that a span ID. It has to have a correlation ID. We call that a trace ID. It has to have a start time. It has to have an end time so that we can calculate duration. But the most important thing is it has something called a causality ID. We call that a parent span ID, which was the thing that was active when this new span was created. That allows us to build causality. You called this external API when this API was called on your service. The causality is what links those two together. As opposed to logs, where we've got a correlation and we use time as that identifier to say the order in which things happened. And then it has just an arbitrary um, list of attributes. Key value pairs and put whatever data you want on there. The more data you put on, the more useful things become. Really, they're just fancy logs. Stickers available afterwards. I take all major credit cards. <laughs> so what is a log then? At its heart, logs are designed for humans. That's what a log is. It's designed for humans. That's why it has a message template on it. It has a mandatory thing which is called a message template, which is the human readable text that you will then interpolate attributes with. But that's what a log is. It's designed for humans to read. It's not designed for computers to read. What we have done is we've tried to make logs structured by just outputting them as JSON at the back. It's not really what a structured log was meant to be. A structured log was meant to be a structured event, just a blob of key value pairs that happened at a point in time. It doesn't have to have a correlation ID. It doesn't have to have a span ID. A log doesn't need any of those. It just needs a message template. Which means that they're really good for things like access logs, for audit logs. But the biggest thing they're useful for is working out whether my tracing's working. I mean, logs are fine, I suppose. If you look deeper into that picture and look at what's on fire, you'll laugh even more. Um, but logs are fine. Logs are not a problem. Misusing logs is the problem. Using logs when you should be using another signal is the problem. I do hate on logs a lot. What I hate on is bad logs. Fun fact, we did an analysis of our customer, one of our customers recently who was complaining about costs. So we did an analysis to work out why they were paying so much for sending us um, all their logs to us. 10% of their logs said, here. <coughs> 10%. Because they're not designed for production observability. That wasn't what they were being designed for. They were being designed for their local stuff. They'd say, here, so they could see it in their log output. And that was then being sent to their vendors on the back end. They're not designed for production observability. If you design your logs for production observability, if you make them wide, add tons of context onto them, logs are great. Well, this is the reason why we don't talk about pillars in, in open telemetry and observability. Because if you can get the answer to all of your questions from one of these signals, you don't need the others. If you can get it all from metrics, just use metrics. It's the cheapest way. So what do we mean by metric? So metrics are two things. We have a big M metric and a little m metric. A little m metric is something we measure. It's not new, this is language. Little m metrics are things that we measure, KPIs. They generally mean things that we graph or visualize. Big M metrics are time series aggregates, where we take and aggregate a lot of things over a period of time, like 10, 15, 20 seconds, and we reduce it down to one data point with a series of labels that identify it. So we might say we're going to measure the latency, how long it takes a request to fire back to a user. 
we'll add some labels to that metric. Maybe it's the, the verb. Atheist rock in a corner and say, please stop. I think the server actually verbalizes that for you. But that's not a slight on metrics. It's not what they're built for. They're not built for high cardinality data. They're built for low cardinality data, for long-term storage, because they're cheap to store. If you can get away with just doing that, just use metrics. They're the cheapest form of telemetry. Unfortunately, they don't generally give you the why. They'll tell you the when. This API endpoint is running slow. They won't tell you why, though. For that, you need to dig deeper. And that's where you need the high cardinality, which is number of possible values for an attribute, and high dimensionality, which is the number of attributes that you pass. Because that context is what really allows you to do things. Setting up signals is really easy. We have something called auto-instrumentation, which for anybody who's done anything with instrumentation in the past, it's an agent. We call them auto-instrumentation in OpenTelemetry. What it means is it's codeless. You put it alongside your application, and it instruments your application. If it's JavaScript, it's using monkey patching. Same with Ruby. If it's doing .NET, then it's using startup hooks. If it's using Java, it's using JVM profilers. But ultimately, it's no code for you or your developers. You sideload it. Use things like environment variables to configure it so you don't have to write any code for it. But it's really good at getting started. It's not the end goal. Because it's really verbose. Because what it's doing is it's enabling every bit of telemetry it can possibly find and then you try and turn things off. But what it's essentially doing is treating your application the same as everybody else. Because everybody in here just builds a website, yeah, with one database behind it. Because that's what all applications are. They're not. It does treat everything the same, the same as any vendor agent would. Because it can't know that you're an e-com platform. Therefore, checkout latency is important to you. Number of items in a basket is actually important to you. So it can pull that information in. It doesn't do that. It's really easy to do, though. You can use something like PowerShell if you hate yourself. <laughs> or you could do it with Bash, if you want to do it properly. <laughs> uh, enough. <laughs> d d I did I pass the harassment law thing? <laughs> Just know what's the word. <laughs> um, but ultimately, it's really easy. All we're really doing is we're, this is doing the .NET one, because I'm a .NET guy. Um, works similar in Java, you use Java options. In JavaScript, you use two entry points. But ultimately, there's no change in the code. It's really easy. You can obviously go and do the code. I'm not going to go through code examples of how you do it in the code. Generally, it's incredibly easy to replicate what we're doing with agents in code. In .NET, it's about 10 lines of code. In Java, the agent is actually the way to go. In Ruby, it's about five or six lines of code. JavaScript, I believe it's about 20. But it's essentially just put that in once. And we use things like instrumentation libraries to make that easy. If you're using something like Kubernetes, you can use the Kubernetes operator. Install the Kubernetes operator as a CRD. It will then just instrument all of your applications magically. Auto-instrumentation works across Java, .NET, PHP, Ruby, um, Python. I think there's five, maybe six now. But if you are in an environment where you really just want to get started, use something like the operator in Kubernetes. Your developers, the people you're supporting, your users, don't need to even worry about it. You'll get basic distributed tracing. You'll get basic logs. You'll get basic metrics. Put those into a back end, see what you can see. As soon as they start seeing it, it'd be really useful if I had this bit of information. Go and add it. Not a problem. But it's really good to get started. But that's instrumentation. You're not going to get much further. And I'll show a little bit of a demo of how we do that. But I want to talk a little bit about the collector. The collector is another tool that OpenTelemetry provide, which is really useful in a lot of scenarios. Now, if you're pushing things to a vendor, if you're pushing things to a back end, you've generally got something like an API key that you need to put in your applications. Now, if you can imagine that you need to roll API keys, yeah? Do you want to roll 3,200 microservices when you change your API key? Because I don't. 
What the OpenTelemetry collector allows you to do is it works as an OTLP proxy. You can configure your applications to point to the collector, and the collector can then point it onto your backend, which means that the credentials for that happen inside of your collector because it's inside of the network. You don't need credentials for the collector for your applications to send to the collector, which makes it incredibly useful for centralizing config. The other one is securing egress. This is why security people love it. If you're working in zero trust environments, chances are your front end applications do not have access to the internet. They will not be able to send data to an arbitrary third party that you've just decided you want to send it to. And then you go to your security team, it's like, can you open up the IP address for this server? And they go, what's the IP address? It's like, the internet. <laughs> and you get laughed out of the building. With something like the collector, you can have a single exit point from your network. Your applications can point to the collector. The collector can be the thing that pushes things out. Which sounds good, and they'll go, yeah, but I'm still not going to let you do it. And then you go, well, what you could do is you can now control all of the data that exits the network for telemetry reasons. You can redact things. You can filter things. You can add rules that say, if I see, 14, if I see 16 numbers together, I'm going to redact that because that's a card number and you're an idiot. You should not be sending that data. You can search for regex patterns. You can search for field names. You can search for addresses and postcodes. And you tell them that and they're like, what, so I can do this now? I can control those rules with you. I can do these things through a PR and through GitOps to be able to deploy this collector, this new collector with new rules. And the security team will love you. And that's always a game changer in organizations. If you ever start a new organization, the first people that you friend is the receptionist and the security team. And make your life so much easier. And the other thing is, if you're using languages like Ruby, and I do hope you're not, <laughs> they don't really have background threads. So sending telemetry becomes a synchronous action. It also happens in functions as a service solutions like Lambda and Azure Functions. You need to be able to send that telemetry, but you need to send it before the request ends because then your Lambda turns off. You can use things like ADOT, which is the open telemetry collector for Amazon, um, or Amazon distribution of the open telemetry collector or something like that which runs as a layer that does these things. So anything that you can do as synchronous performance, you can offload onto the collector and that will do all the async for you. So it can be really useful from performance angles. But the other thing is it's really good for enrichment. If you're using Kubernetes, it'd be really cool if all of your metrics and all of your traces and all of your logs had the pod name that it came from. It had the IP that it came from. It had the deployment set that deployed that particular pod. It had the replica set, the node, the cluster. Centralized enrichment, because the collector can do all that for you. It can add things like, oh, this came out of this region. So your application doesn't need to know that. You don't need to add onto every span or every log. This was in EU West 1. Because if it goes through a collector that's in EU West 1, you can just tag every one of your signals with that. It is an incredibly powerful bit of kit, but it also does translation. So you can have things that come in from one side, whether that's if you're currently using something like Jaeger or Zipkin in your applications, and you want to be able to move to open telemetry, but you can't do it quickly. What you can do is put the open telemetry collector in place, have that receive your Jaeger data, your Zipkin data, and output the same data, the same Zipkin data, into your Zipkin instance. But then it can also start pushing out OTLP data as well. Because the way it works is we have receivers on one side, we have processors in the middle that do enrichment, redaction, that kind of stuff, and then we have exporters on the, out, on the back. We use these for fan out. What that means is you can get one signal in on the receiver, and send that same signal data out to two exporters, or three exporters, or ten exporters. You can do things like push all of that data into S3, or Azure Blob Storage, and also send it to your vendor. You can do things like, I'm going to send it to my SIEM analysis tool, 
but I'm also going to send it to a production debugging tool as well. And you can say that I'm going to send this to a third party for production debugging, so I'm going to redact all the data first. But the stuff I send into S3 I don't need to redact because that's inside of my zone. It's inside of my zone of control, therefore I don't need to. I only have four hours so I can't talk about that completely. <laughs> But well, there's various different ways that you can deploy it. There's a temptation, a lot of the time, to use a direct mode. So from your application and the SDKs in your application, you push the data straight to your backend, whether that's a vendor or something that's hosted locally. My advice is never do that, purely because you will at some point want to use the collector. I guarantee it, in production you will have a use case for it. The collector is just a container. If you're using Kubernetes, there's established deployment patterns for it, there's Helm charts for it, it's easy. If you're using a cloud platform, deploy it in Azure Container Apps. Deploy it in Fargate. It's easy, but send all your data through it. You will thank yourself later when you need to redact data, when you need to enrich it. The more advanced scenarios come when we get to fanning out and load balancing, because the collector itself is stateless. You should be able to fan out as much as you possibly can. And they just receive all of that data, logs, metrics, traces. It'll soon be accepting profiles, the work's ongoing for that, but it would just be a proxy. And my slides are out of order. So, uh, there we go, right. Sampling. I talked about the cost crisis in observability right now, where certain vendors, not naming any names, see custom metrics as a revenue stream. And custom metrics are the idea of how many individual data series am I going to give you for free, and then how much am I going to charge you for them. So when you do metrics, what you'll do is you'll say, like I say, verb, root, then maybe you'll say the host name because you want to know which host served that because maybe one host is running slow. You can very quickly get up to thousands and thousands of custom metrics and then they turn up and ask for your first, second and third born because that's a lot of money. The way that we get around this is using sampling. Sampling is not a new concept. The best example I've used for sampling is, if you think about election exit polls, we don't go and ask every single person in the entire country who they voted for, because that wouldn't work. What we do is we take a sample set. We try to make that a representative sample by going into different locations, choosing different people from different backgrounds, from different areas. We use sampling in everything that we do. In telemetry terms, we use sampling when we talk about logs and we talk about traces. We don't sample metrics because they're already sampled data. We've already removed the context and added one number. We've already sampled it. With logs and with traces, we sample by keeping the entire correlation or not. We either sample the entire distributed trace or we get rid of the entire distributed trace. We do that by making decisions on various different characteristics. There's two ways of doing it. Head sampling, the most efficient way of doing things. It happens when your request comes in. OpenTelemetry has propagators and samplers that do this inside of your SDKs that allow you to make decisions. So you can say, I'm gonna sample, say it's a bot, say you're looking at the user agent because it's a web request. You'll say, I'm gonna sample the bots at one in one million. I don't really care about that data, it's not hugely important to me. But I'm going to sample my home page at one in 20. I'm going to keep one, discard 19. The issue with this is that you don't know whether that trace is actually going to be interesting, you don't know whether that log correlation is going to be interesting, because you don't know whether it's going to error. You've already decided at that point that you're going to discard all the information. You don't know whether it's going to be an error. That's where tell the tail sampling happens, which is in the collector. But ultimately what this is doing is allowing us to retain context. The goal of this is to reduce our storage, 
reduce our ingest or egress, depending on whether that's an internal platform or external. That's ultimately what we're trying to do. By doing that, we also make querying faster. And the advantage of making querying faster is we ask more questions. We ask more questions, then we get answers quick, we get more answers. We get more answers, we find the bug quicker. So everything should be quick, and that's where doing sampling can work really well. So with head sampling, we do that. We, we make that decision as the web request comes in. I'm using activity there, that's the .NET term for span. But before the span is created, it's incredibly efficient, just like metrics, because it allows us to be able to um, reduce the process overhead because all the way down the stack now, we're not creating spans, we're not creating any data. But we only have access to a very limited set. If somebody's put something in an S3 bucket and we're triggering off the back of an S3 bucket, that's our context, all we've really got is the key from the S3 bucket. Maybe the metadata of the file that triggered it. Is that enough for us to know whether we should keep or discard this trace? Or this log correlation? Probably not. The alternative is if we use tail sampling in the collector. The collector runs as a central point. What we do is after we receive the first span, we wait 20, 30 seconds for all of the rest of the spans or all the rest of the logs to come in. It runs as part of the collector but it has access to all of the span data for that trace. All of it. It has access to all of the spans in that trace. All of the logs in that trace. All of the span events in that trace. All the span links in that trace. Which means the decisions that you can make range from this trace was slow, this trace was for an individual user, my personal favourite is this trace was for our exec team. So let's keep all of those. <laughs> <coughs> but you can make decisions based on anything that's in that trace, in anything that's in those log entries. The big problem though is it delays sending the traces to the back end. Because we've got to wait until the entire trace has come through. <coughs> we don't actually know when the entire trace has come through because we don't know what the last span is going to look like. So we have to make a guess. It is not bulletproof. But it does require all of our applications to send all of their spans and logs to a single point. If we're running in multiple availability zones, that means at least two thirds of our traffic is gonna transition an availability zone. If you're running in AWS, they see that as a revenue stream as well which is then a problem. So you do need to think about what's happening. Okay, getting towards the end and then I'll do a, bit, a quick demo and then pass over. Um, so what's coming up? Um, we've had some semantic conventions signed off already, which is for HTTP. Semantic conventions are the names that OpenTelemetry have given to certain attribute names for logs, certain attribute names for spans, and certain metric names and labels. Because I mean, I know everybody loves to bike shed naming conventions. Um, it's everybody's favorite pastime. But OpenTelemetry have decided that these are the names for things. So you can use them. It stops that debate from happening. What that allows us to do then is just concentrate on our applications. It also allows vendors to make assumptions and backends to make assumptions. If we've got URL.path in one of our attributes, great. I know what that is. I know that's the URL that you hit. If I've got http.root, I know that was the root, not the URL. We can make decisions, which means you can do interesting visualizations. We've got more libraries coming up for more different um, bits of applications, whether that's Java, Ruby, whether that's for SQL, for NoSQL, for SQLite, for Cosmos, for Dynamo. They're just constantly adding more libraries, which mean that you don't need to actually instrument your applications yourself. The thing that you add is your custom context. You don't have to add the rest. Better documentation, that's my personal one. I do a lot of the documentation um, for .NET, for instance. Um, I very welcome people telling me that there's missing bits of documentation so we can add them, because it just makes things better. But ultimately, the reason I do these talks is I need to know from the community what's missing. 
What's stopping you from adopting it? Like majority of the room have op heard of open telemetry. We had five hands of people using it. What's stopping you from doing it? And what can we do in open telemetry to help that? That's really important. Honeycomb allow me to be here. We have a free tier, free forever. You can send us 20 million events, sign up. Um, we also literally wrote the book on observability engineering. It's a free download from our website. Um, it's an O'Reilly book. You can probably get them to give you that book um, for, for giving away. Um, but that's, that is the, what is open telemetry? I hope that's filled in a lot of the gaps about what open telemetry is. Now I am gonna give a quick demo before I pass over to Jamie. Um, duplicate. Apparently I closed my window, let's have a look. Okay, this is a solution that you can actually go away and do yourself if you want. Um, it's on our GitHub, um, it's called Observability Day Workshop. But what we've got is a four application solution, instrumented purely with open telemetry. The solution doesn't know where, I mean, we're going to use Honeycomb, obviously, but it doesn't know where Honeycomb is, other than the fact that what we've done is added some environment variables. The environment variables, can everybody see that? The environment variables tell us what we're going to send. And you notice that environment variable there, it's hotel exporter. It's a generic variable from OpenTelemetry and a generic variable for the headers. So, and export. Let's see if it does. This is where the lights flicker. I'm not using Node, it's fine. It's not going to do an NPM install. I did it in the hotel the other day on Node, and I'm, I swear the lights flickered. Come on. <coughs> Who else is downloading Dockers? <laughs> But ultimately, what we've, what we've done, if you, if you look at these solutions, here is the .NET one, for instance. All we've done to set up tracing is that. Those lines there, that's the entirety of setting up OpenTelemetry, if you do it through your code. Obviously, adding in the libraries into the project file. There's four libraries that we've added in there. But these two here, those are our instrumentation libraries. These are what exist in Java, in JavaScript, all of those tools. And they instrument, in this scenario, ASP.NET Core, which is our inbound solution, and HTTP Client, which is the outbound solution. <laughs> if we're doing this in Node, need to remember how to do node. Like I say, it's a few more lines in node. But what we get is what we call memeinator. We had boring applications to do all this and now um, we decided that we wanted something a little bit more exciting. So what Meminator does is it's going to choose some random phrases, some random pictures, and put them together, because it's fun, um, if it works. There you go. There you go. Um, and what that's going to do is we can then use that to do, look at our traces. Now it becomes, I mean, these are things that are really pretty normal. That's a trace view. You've seen these before. The causality that, it, that happens in there, this is just using tracing data. You can do this with logs and there's metrics in there as well, but this is just the tracing data. That does mean that we can do some interesting things with that data though, because if I show you an example of something with custom data in it, something where what we've done is added 
We've added in custom instrumentation, we've added in attributes to spans and logs into all of that data. What that allows us to be able to do now, which is something that we weren't able to do before with pure metrics, is do analysis across different spans to be able to take all of that additional context and be able to work out what correlations, what's common between these things. Because systems fail in weird and wonderful ways. With metrics, you're not going to be able to do things like user IDs. You're not going to be able to put things in your metrics that say user ID. You're not going to be able to have that high cardinality data. That is why traces and logs are the future of observability. Infrastructure <laughs> metrics, those are valid. Use the right tool for the right job, the right signal for the right situation. Use the backends that provide you with the right information, the right value. And that is the power of open telemetry. That's me. Um, I will be around for the rest of the evening, so feel free to come and ask questions. Um, tell me why I wasn't right. Super stuff, Martin. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so, um, oh, well, my head is absolutely full of about anybody else's, and maybe you've got something else that's full. So let's have a brief comfort break. Um, Jamie, I know I said we were going to go straight into yours, but let's have a brief comfort break. So literally just like four and a half minutes. I think there's some water outside as well if you want to get some refreshments, and then we'll get a second show on the road. Thank you.